Welcome everybody. Uh, and I'm very happy to, uh, to be here tonight. My name is Christian. I'm going to share uh, my desktop and I would like to start with a few words um, to uh, say what is, uh, why, why am I here? What is the, the connection uh, to this group? And I decided that I want to introduce myself by four songs. Yeah. Um, they are here in a JSON format because this is an IT talk for an IT audience. The first song is uh, something like the unofficial anthem of Berlin, uh, the city there where I grew up. <clears throat> and uh, it's something about 20 years old. And during the time that song was played, I did my PhD in biochemistry here. Um, I then moved to Poland and the, the first uh, the first song that I remember from uh, from actually being while being in Poland is uh, Hey Soko, and I only learned a couple of weeks ago that uh, the the contents of the song Hey Soko actually plays in Ukraine. Um, in um, uh, in uh, Poland, I learned to know my uh, my wife, who is also a Python developer, and we moved together uh, to Berlin back, and we have two wonderful kids which is kind of the topic of the, the third song here on the list. And besides all of this, uh, I'm also a Finnish uh, citizen. So I wanted to have a Finnish song on the list. And uh, I thought that there's probably um, no Finnish song that anybody here knows uh, except for, for this one, which is a cover version. So the topic today is uh, testing REST APIs, and I would like to spend the next two, the, the, sorry, the next one and a half hours roughly uh, on this topic and go through some practical uh, aspects of testing Python REST applications in Python, of course. I posted a GitHub link where uh, all the material is. Uh, it's in the chat box. If you don't see that one because you joined later and it's not visible anymore, I'm going to post it again in uh, in a couple of minutes once I'm back in the browser. In case you have any questions, then then please interrupt me or or, or raise a hand, um, and I'm happy to take time to uh, to answer questions, even if uh, basic ones or more advanced ones, if I can answer them. I had the impression that this is uh, this is a very competent audience that I'm uh, having here from my uh, from my initial conversations with Data Science Ukraine. So uh, um, I'm I'm prepared for getting questions that um, I'm not able to answer. So uh, what brought what else brought me to this talk? Um, I spend a lot of my time uh, actually writing and testing uh, REST APIs. Uh, I work for a uh, for a German bank as a freelancer, and uh, there we do something that is remotely similar. And uh, I hope you understand that I won't disclose any details uh, about that and keep this as a pocket example. What I want to do in the following is uh, to write a or actually test a web application uh, where someone can request songs through a REST API. And um, uh, these are the songs that, uh, that I'll be working with. So they have a couple of different fields. And I have a little a uh, API skeleton uh, already prepared. I'm using the the fast API framework here, and that is here in the um, in the app.py file. Just for letting uh, letting the dust settle a bit at the very beginning, um, I would like to to ask uh, by maybe by by a show of uh, of hands in the in the chat box is anyone here in the uh, in the group familiar with fast API? Do we have um, 
Sasha, do we have? Oh, we have a plus uh, a, a thumbs up button. That's a few. Has anyone used a a different Python web framework like Flask or Django or that's a few fantastic. Okay. Um if you if you has is there anyone who has no idea what a REST API is? It does not seem so good. So um the the fast API web framework is one of the easier ways to connect your Python functions to a machine readable web interface. So it's not about HTML pages, it's about sending these JSON documents around and make your um, Python program talk to a JavaScript front end or to, or to some, some other machine uh, that is somewhere on the internet. It's like the, one of the key technologies and fast API became really, really famous in this. Now, um, this tutorial that I want to give you, or this workshop, is meant uh, that you can try this out at home. So uh, I wrote this as a step-by-step -step instruction here in uh, on the GitHub page. I'm now posting the link again. Um, and there's a couple of things uh, listed here that I won't do because they are already they are already prepared. For instance, uh, there is a section that says, um, please um, install all the Python libraries necessary for that. Uh, if you have basic knowledge in Python, then uh, then you might may have seen the pip uh, install command before. We also will need in a moment to, um, to set a Python path, but let me first, uh, let me first, paste the material link into the Zoom chat box. So, um, so what I want to do is uh, to run uh, to run this application, and uh, there's in with Fast API there's a very uh, very lightweight architecture around it uh, that we have to run before uh, we can think about testing it. So I would like to briefly show how is this supposed to look like. Um, and then we go about the testing. So what this code is doing is that we have a couple of, uh, of imports here from the fast API library. Then we have these uh, here normal Python functions that have been decorated with a router that basically connects this function to a URL um, on the local machine. What you also see is that at the bottom, we don't have anything like a main section. Yeah? Um, so we are using an external program to run this entire thing. This hello, uh, I won't use this, this hello uh, world endpoint for, for anything. It's mainly here for, uh, for backup purposes. Uh, this songs function is the main one that we are going to use because that um, is supposed to to find songs in the uh, in the database. Let's see if um, we can run this thing. So I'm uh, running everything here from the terminal. I'm going into this exercise folder, and I have to use a command called uvcorn app which is the name of the, the module and app, which is the name of the application inside that module. I would suppose that this is, uh, if I'm lucky, this runs right away. The path to this Python folder is already set. So um, I can see that it's running here on my local machine and this is the address that I can visit in my browser right away. And I have to append this slash docs. And the nice thing about fast API is, is that you get like a um, 
simple user interface, uh, which is based on, uh, on the Swagger library. Um, the great thing about this is that you don't have to, uh, to write anything to do this, you you, to use this. You define your endpoints just uh, as you would before, but you can use this to try out. So I can, for instance, check the, the hello button, say, try this out. And then say execute because this one doesn't take any parameters. And then I can see here right away what is the return code and what is the response. And it says unsurprisingly, hello world. I can try the same for the other endpoint. Try this one out. This one is more interesting because uh, it takes a parameter. At the moment, the parameter is here in the URL, and that could be uh, that could be a number from our library of songs. Let's see if that is working. It is, and we get a JSON record. Another mode to use this endpoint is we could also uh, um, of the name of a song and then we get also the according record back so it's great for manually testing in uh, a rest api which is uh, and i i use this program on a daily basis almost but it's in the long term, it's not very satisfactory because you want to automate stuff at some point when your API gets bigger and there's more use cases to cover. Yeah. So this is why I'll switch off uh, this uh, web interface at the moment and start thinking about what we need if we want to run automated tests. Has, has anyone in the audience um, used the PyTest library before? Some of you have, good. So then some, you, you might, or quite a few, awesome. Um, PyTest is like the, the, the gold standard for writing automated tests in Python. And uh, what I would like to do is run a few Python, um, Python tests against uh, this, um, against these two endpoints. So a, a good, and what I have here, if we look at the structure of this project, then uh, I've already split up my code base into two separate folders. So there is one folder, the song finder with um, lots of Python modules, uh, the ones that do the actual work. Um, I will go into more details of this um, in a short time. And then there is a separate folder with tests. And in this tests folder, the PyTest test framework is usually looking by for everything that is called test. So it finds modules that are called test. And in those modules, it looks for functions that start with test. So, and here we have a um, a example for an API test. Yeah, so what this does, how this works is it uh, uses a convenience function from test API that starts a test client. The test client means we, we start a server without actually starting a server. And then we can use that to directly send get and post requests. For instance, we could request this hello world endpoint, and then check what status code we get. 200 is the status code for, okay, everything is working. And then we also want to get the entire data back from, uh, from that endpoint in the JSON format and compare it to something that we expect. And this is something that we can nicely automate. In, Next, I would like to run this test and see if it passes, and only then I can um, proceed with the next step. How do you run tests with PyTests? With PyTest, it's very easy. 
um, you basically all you need to do is let me shrink this window a bit. All you need to do is write the word I test. Wait a second. Ah, I think my path is not set correctly. This is where I need to put in a Python path, export Python path equal. Home projects test test tutorial exercise. And now let's try this again. This is how it how a PyTest session should look like when it's successful. So there is um, PyTest tells me, yes, it found uh, found one test in this file. That's what the green dot here stands for, ran it and one of the tests passed. There are two options that I recommend to everybody using this library. One of them is the minus V option that makes the, the output a little bit longer by listing the tests individually. And the other one is the minus S option. Minus S is the more important one of those because um, when a test fails, then um, you would see everything that went to the standard output um, here in the output from PyTest. And of course, you need that information sometimes to debug. So this, this simple test is working. Let's add another one. I want to have a test for finding a song. The basic procedure is the same. So I can copy a little bit of this code so i need i still need a test client i want to go to the songs endpoint and ask for and let's let's ask for the for the stevie wonder song and i definitely want to have a status code 200 and let's store this in a result variable and I want to assert that the artist is equal to Stevie Wonder. Now, of course, um, uh, let's see if it's working. I did not make any typos or anything. I have a, another test that passes. And this basically works for all the um, uh, for all the URLs and status codes that I might um, that I might put in here. Good. And that's the basic mechanic. In the following, I want to make this more sophisticated by adding structure and uh, using tricks that help you when your test um, uh, framework becomes or your your application becomes bigger but i'd like to to stop for a short moment and check whether there are any um uh, any questions that we should get out of the way, way right now anyone with a question i'm happy to take questions from the from the chat box or by voice Ivan, you have one. No, I'm not. No, oh, sorry. I'm so, sorry, I saw you. Um, unmuted for the moment. So if there are no more questions, then we, we can, uh, we might as well proceed and see what else, um, wh what else we can do to make this more sophisticated. So I'll skip. Yeah, I move forward to the to the next section to the next section here that is labeled defining entities. Um, I'm um, walking here kind of in the footsteps of one of the the greatest programming teachers of our time. Um, some of you may know him. His name is um, Robert C. Martin, uh, better known as Uncle Bob, and um, 
one um, of the uh, great learnings that I made from him is uh, that it's absolutely worth to have a structure that is clear and transparent. And I would like to use one such structure here today, and that is the boundary control entity or BCE pattern. And that should help us to uh, have components with very clear responsibilities. And they will also help us with testing the application. What the BCE pattern basically um, means is that you divide up your code into uh, into three files or, or three, three components. One of them is called the entity. And here you define data structures or data objects that um, you can send around. Um, so that your uh, that your one part of your application exchanges with the outside world. Then you have bound a boundary or multiple boundaries. These are the top level functions. Uh, ideally, your boundaries should be the only places that the outside world uses to communicate with your um, application. And then there is control. Control is everything that, that doesn't fit into the other two. Yeah. And I would like to start um, with the uh, with the entity. Um, we already have an um, an entity prepared here. Let's take a look at that one. And uh, that is in the file uh, entity.py. Um, and this is something that not so long ago did not look too much like uh, like Python code. Yeah, why um, we are defining a class um, in uh, which we define types. Typing is a relatively new thing in, uh, in Python, but it has gained tremendous importance over the, the past couple of years. Um, this is both a compact way um, uh, of defining your, uh, your data structures. Uh, and um, in contrary to um, the earlier attempts with typing in Python, um, uh, when you use this Pydentic library, uh, these things get actually type checked. Uh, they get type checked at runtime, not at, com at at build or compile time. So it's not not quite the same as in Java or C, but it's really really useful. So uh, Pydentic is going to complain if we try to define a song uh, request or a song response and then forget about some of the fields or introduce extra ones that uh, that are not here. Yeah. Mm. I'd like to write a, a, a test against uh, against one of these just to demonstrate how this would look like. So uh, let's um, let's create a new test file. Call this test entity. We were arguing a bit whether whether one should actually write such uh, such tests, unit tests for your entities um, uh, in a in a project, and we decided that we sometimes we do. So what I basically want to check is whether it's possible to create a song request. So I need to have a song ID. Let's do a seven. Give the song a title. Let's take first first start song that comes to my mind tonight. Artist. Now I've shot my shot myself in the foot because I don't know uh, how the the was it Kalish Orchestra how that is spelled. I might need some help here. Um, uh, that's, uh, can you please tell me how this is, whether this is correct? If anyone, Kalush. Kalush. Good. And I would like to, to check whether this is working. We need an import, of course. 
and this entity belongs to the song finder application or test or um so entity import song test now when I now run the tests again I should see um, a third test coming up. Now this time we have a test that's failing. Finally, let's see what it is failing about. It says, oh, there's a field required. There's a value error message and it says name is missing. Now I need to check how is my entity defined. So title artist year. Songs, song ID. Ah, no, I said song re request, but I meant song response. Yes. And that passes our entity is working. The great thing about Pydentic is if I now do something like this, I feed in a string, maybe that gets that gets converted automatically. If I put in a uh, a string where I define an integer, it um, gets rejected. Uh, I get an error right away. Um, and that is a type, type safety um, that was hard to find in Python otherwise. So I'm, a, I'm very glad about this. Now, the good thing about these entities is that we can use them in our API right away. And um, I have an example for that, that we can build into the app.py. We have to modify our request uh, a little bit for that. So I'm basically restructuring this header Let's make this one line. I think it's might be a bit easier to read. So this is the this is the new function definition. This is the old function definition. So um, the name of the function is not really important, but we move from a simple query into a query with a with an object type. Now we need to change this here. I think the query had a name field and have to use that here as well. And if we want our um, uh, our find song endpoint to return a song response, we need to create one. These, uh, uh, these um, entity objects, they can be they are very easy to create from, from JSONs or Python dictionaries with this double star notation. Yeah, this is a fantastically um, um, fantastically useful expression. If you load this from a JSON and you know all the fields they should fit, in, fit into this type of entity object, you don't have to do an explicit mapping of all the fields. You say star star, my object should become this and you have it. Then, then I want to um, have my imports in the right place to keep the code tidy. So I move this up here. Good. Now let's see if this is still working. I expect this to fail actually. I get a 404. Why? Because we just modified um, our endpoint. Yeah, so this is uh, the endpoint is still named songs, but we no longer have a URL parameter. So we need to adjust the test for the endpoint as well. So the endpoint now becomes a bit more interesting. So instead of this three here, we actually need to send in a request as a JSON 
And for that request in our test, we can use our uh, our entity, say a song request with name equals three. I will have to import it as well from songfinder.entity import song request. And I'll import the song response as well because we, we will need that in a moment. Let's see, how, let's, let's run the tests again and see how far we get. Object of type song request is not JSON serializable. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I think you may have to put in here the. We have to put in the actual JSON here. We, we, we need this. We will need the song re request and the response, but later. So here it has to be an actual JSON with the name of the tree in. And fast API is going to convert these to, um, to the request objects. Let's run this. And our tests are passing again. So we have our endpoint working, and now it's internally using um, uh, using uh, the entity object. Yeah, so we have a clean interface. We have um, some um, some basic validation that fast AP, API is doing here. Yeah. Mm. We might want. Um, but the, the code here is not really pretty. Yeah, the, the code is not really pretty. Yeah, so this is where the next part of this BCE pattern comes. Um, I actually would like to move this most of this code out of here. And a really good way to do that is to have a boundary function. I define my boundary function in... Um, uh, in a file called boundary, but before I go there, I would like to show you the, the end result of this. So I want to get this this entire this entire code here that the actual finding of the song has nothing to do um, uh, with uh, the uh, with the web API. API. I want to separate the the API part from the business logic that I want to run here. So. Instead of doing this, all I want to do here is return some find song with my queries. And that's all I want to do. Now I have two functions, find song. Um, I need to rename this sensor. Now, this is, this is how a, a, neat, um, a neat API endpoint should look like, in my opinion. All we have here is what goes in, what comes out, what URL it is, and uh, where I should go to get the work done. Let's import this find song function. From song finder, the code that was there before, I still have it in my clipboard. And from the boundary, I expect to import this find song function. Now let's put the code there. Um, no, I don't think this belongs here. So for now, I have all the code moved to the to the boundary. So far, it's been a rather simple um, refactoring. Let's see if it's working. No, it's failing because I moved over the code, but I forgot to adjust the imports. So let's carry these over here. JSON and OS, they are not required by my app uh, either. So I move them to my boundary as well. Run the tests again.
now something went wrong because boundary is in a, it's in a different folder and my JSON file with the songs is in, in a subfolder as well. So my path needs to be updated. And it works, I have it working again. I recently read Martin Fowler's book about refactoring and our, he, uh, he is a great proponent of uh, what we are doing right now, like refactoring in small steps, run your tests, change a piece of code, run your tests again, make sure they pass, and then you can do the next refactor. So we have a clear about a clean boundary here. Find song that is finding songs. Now we could write a test against that boundary. And the good thing about that is when we have that, we don't need to uh, know in, in the test, we don't need anything that has to do with an API. Uh, all we need is the boundary. So let's write such a test. I might borrow a bit of code here from my simple find song test. Let's create a new test file. I call this test song finder because song finder is uh, the, uh, the application that we are actually writing. So what, what do I want to test? The code I want to test is in song finder dot boundary and I import find song. And now I don't need any test client. I do need a request. So I need to import my entities again from song finder .mpt import song request and song response. So my request would be a song request where the name is a three was it called name even in the entity this is this is one of the advantages of having an entity it's really easy to look up stuff yeah in this i can this is so much so much easier to debug as if you have, would have these hard coded somewhere in your code so i have my my name given here. I think my Python interpreter is still complaining about something. Is it the spacing? No. Ah, let's see what happens. Um, and then I want to have a response by calling find song with my request. I don't check for a status code because here I'm calling the boundary. I'm not calling the API anymore. And now I can check assert response dot song ID equals three and assert response dot artist is DB wonder. And I might also have an assert for the type of the response and say that should be a song response. I'm not sure why this is in, in red. I think my PyCharm hasn't indexed this project properly. Let's see what PyTest tells me. Expression cannot contain assignment. Why not? Ah, because this is a string. Yeah, this looks better. Now we have already four tests, so this keeps growing. So we are testing the boundary 
and have a clean separation of things. I want to do one more uh, refactoring than our um, uh, than our um, BCE pattern is complete. Then we have a complete song finder here. Um, there's also this, the third thing is controller. Yeah, so this boundary is meant to be only the entry point for the functionality that we are writing. So it also should not do any of the work. Yeah, it defines a uh, it defines an interface just without the API part. So if anything, it should do error handling and um, uh, and logging maybe. We could uh, I leave an error handling thing here and everything else I take out again um, and um, call the and delegate that to the controller instead. Here's my controller as a function execute query. And now here we do the work. Now my um, two imports from the Python standard libraries, they, they will again have to move once again. Um, this time they move to the controller and hopefully they are going to stay here because I don't want to move them once again. Now we have a controller function. Um, that actually does the work. I'm not going to. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to test this. I'm not going to test the controller directly. Yeah, this is not meant to be um, to be tested because other parts of my program are not supposed to touch the controller. It's meant to be completely internal. I. He, this is the space where I want to move things uh, um, around freely inside my song finder. Yeah, so I want to invent uh, creative solutions for how to best find songs. All my tests should care about is that the uh, boundary is doing its job. So I'm going to write, I'm going to call this execute query function with my query, say there is a result. And if there is a result, return it. If not, I want to create an index error. And that's the that's the, the behavior I'm testing here. Yeah, so we are we are basically putting putting layers of uh, of interface between our um, working code and our app. And that makes it that gives us uh, flexibility when we write tests. Okay, um, I want to add one last thing, and then I take a short, uh, a short break for that we can all catch breath, and um, you can ask questions if you like. But let's um, let's let's test one more thing before we do that. I, first of all, I just did a refactoring. I need to run the tests. It's still the same for tests. They are still working, but now there's now there's two situations that we have not tested. Yeah, our tests they are actually um, a little bit uh, a little bit tricky. Yeah, and one way to find this out is by using test coverage. In PyTest, it's quite easy to check test coverage. There's the a plugin called PyTest Coverage that I have installed here. It's in the requirements for this project, you can specify what you actually would like to calculate coverage for. And here's here I would like to calculate test coverage for um, the entire song finder. And um, I get um, all four Python files that are in the song finder. Uh, the repository we haven't um, talked about, we are not using that. Controller and entity are fully tested and boundary. Yeah, there's actually one line missing, the one with the error. And I would like to test that situation as well. I want to have defined behavior for the error case. So I would like to, um, to test the situation where things go wrong. 
So I want to have a test where find song comes back with an error. And I can do that when I put in some song number that does not exist. I know it doesn't exist in my test data. Yeah. The problem is I would like to have an assertion here somehow, but I cannot do this because what happens is that PyTest finds an, um, an exception before. No, it doesn't. Wait. Um, um, so I would expect that this results in an, uh, in an exception. And then uh, I actually should call find song. So I could logically, I might want to have something similar to this, but this is not working because now I should get to see my exception. So the index error prevents the uh, the test from passing. I want actually to have the opposite, that the error occurs after the test is successful. And that is some that is a standard feature of PyTest. I can import PyTest and say, I can use a context manager with PyTest.raises. What was the name? It was an index error. This, this line here, this context manager with says, if the paragraph below in fact comes back with an index error, then the test shall be successful. If no such error occurs, then the test will fail. Yeah, so I'm, I'm checking for the presence of a test. Let's see if that somehow helps us. Yes. Now we might want to check the, the other, or how it's the other way around. If I put in uh, the ID of the Stevie Wonder song again, then, then my test would fail. PyTest says, sorry, you did not raise the index error. So let's put in the nine, nine, nine song that doesn't exist and we get the error. How is it with behavior on the API side? How can we check for error behavior? I also want to test um, how the API behaves in case I am requesting the song 999. So I make and create an endpoint test, test find song error. I create a test client. I ask for a song with the name 999. And let's say I want to get a response that this, this is a bad request. The HTTP code for, for bad request. And then I don't need the rest. I want this test to work. Does it work? No, it does not. Um, because my boundary throws this index error. And consequently, this crashes the entire execution of the test function. Um, the test function does not get a response for the API because my test client crashes before. Yeah, so I somehow need to tell my API to, to deal with these internal errors. And for that, um, uh, for that, um, fast API has error handlers. This error handler here. We have this. We can use an error handler. The error handler would go to the app. There, there's also ways to put these error handlers into, into a separate module that, um, uh, that mainly increases the, the amount of code. So I'm not bothering with that here today. So how to read this? 
in my API, if um, an index error occurs, call this function, you have the request and you have the, the actual exception, then you can create a log message. I don't want, I know this, you, you would normally use the, the logging module, um, but I'm using a print and return a JSON response with the status code uh, of my code. And one of the things you could use this for is to actually um, not expose to the outside world what is um, uh, what is happening inside your uh, your web server. If you want to build a secure uh, web application, you can imagine that this could be quite important that not everybody can send random JSON documents to your to your API and then um, get get to read your trace backs. So I don't. I want to. I maybe want to see the the uh, the trace back in in some internal server log, but I don't want to get trace back as a as a JSON response. Yeah. Let's see if this is working. It works, and my code coverage went up to one hundred percent. Um, now, at this point, I'd like to to stop for a um, uh, for a second and ask if there are, if there are any any questions already. If not, then I can go on and do something like two more things. Uh, it's almost uh, it's almost seven. Then that's. Um, I would like to uh, introduce fixtures and I would like to see how um, things change if a database comes into play. Let's deal with the fixtures first. Let's take a look at the tests of our song finder. So assume that we are writing a couple of more tests for uh, for different situations. For instance, we could have a test that um, um, uh, that tests by um, by name that that finds a song by name. So we test by you are the song I am. I think it needs to be with a capital S. I have life. And that the, the response to that should be exactly the same. Yeah, let's see if it's working. It works great. Um, but we see that the code is becoming uh, redundant. Yeah, so and I actually would like not to define like all the details here of my um, um, of my uh, of my response once again. Also, um, we might have a situation where we are using the same request um, several times. And this is where fixtures and pipes are becoming quite useful. What I want to have is to have a standard response that I can put here and that PyTest is filling for us so that all I can do is say, um, response equals song response or even shorter i can cut my test to two lines short tests that are easy to read are good tests there's nothing wrong with having a unit test that looks like this and i can do the same here. Now, where would that song response come from? Somehow I need to provide this uh, Stevie Wonder data. Um, and uh, PyTest Py has, I could, I could of course import them from something, but uh, PyTest has a standard mechanism to, uh, to sneak these into your code. 
and these are fixtures defined in the conf test module. This is how they would look like. So you use you import the you need to import PyTest. We also need to import our entities. And um, uh, now we use this PyTest fixture decorator and define a function. And the name here is actually super important because the name is going to be matched with the parameters of your test function. Let's, let's go through this. I just defined a song response. And I want to return a song response object. That one. And that song response object should have a song ID of three and a an artist name Stevie Wonder. And it should have a title. You are the sunshine of my yes. And I think it did not have a year. And we need the decorator I test dot fixture. Now what happens when um when we use this decorator is uh that whenever PyTest comes across a test function that has something here. It looks through all the fixtures it knows and in calls them and inserts um, the, the result here as a parameter to that test function. The great advantage of this is that your uh, fixtures, they get regenerated for every test. So in case your code somehow modifies the feature, the next test is going to obtain a fresh one. Let's, let's see if the tests are still working. And they do work. Uh, they still do the same thing, only they are now much shorter. Uh, one might argue whether uh, this conf test py module. Um, in my opinion, there's a little bit of hidden magic here because uh, the the only the only way um, that this is not directly imported anywhere. Yeah, so uh, the only way you find out that this has to be called conf test py is by reading the pytest uh, documentation. And uh, I don't find that very intuitive, to be honest. So uh, I understand everybody um, mm, um, uh, who who says I would prefer to have a different mechanism than this automatic import of uh, fixtures um, um, and would like to import them manually. So we could as well rename this module to, uh, to fixtures.py, for instance, and then write in our song finder from fixtures import song response. And that, that would do the same thing. Yes, thanks for the for the clarification. There's a little bit of discussion in the chat. Um, if you are, your tests get really big and you have several nested folders, uh, then uh, I think PyTest goes recursively to the to the parent folders until it finds and looks into all the conf test py files until it finds a fixture. Uh, the fi the fixture that it's looking for, or if it runs uh, out of parent folders to check. There is a very nice feature in PyTest that I I haven't prepared anything thing, anything for that that is called parameter parameterized fixtures. So um, you could uh, if you have multiple um, uh, multiple songs that you would like to provide as a fixture, you could make this a parameterized fixture and then generate for every song um, a, um, a a test uh, that uses every instance of the fixture. I, I'm a big fan of, of test parametrization. 
uh, and I use it a lot, uh, but I don't have an example here right under my fingers. Um, I want to to do a another little thing and take a take a look at our controller because in practice things get uh, often get a little bit more um, uh, more complicated and that is usually when um, uh, when a when some infrastructure comes into play. Um, so because at at the moment our song database is a JSON file and it's loaded every time. Uh, that uh, we make a request and with, with four songs that might be okay, but in a real world application, this becomes super inefficient. And uh, normally you would put your songs in a database. Yeah. And uh, that brings up two questions. Yeah, one question number one is how should your uh, program interact with that database? It's question number one. And a question number two is how to test um, an, a web API once there is a database in play. And let's deal with the first question first. Um, um, uh, thanks very much for the uh, for the comment in the uh, in the chat box uh, uh, regarding yield in the in the fixtures. Yes, this is uh, this is a good one. Uh, we might we might try that in the end. Um, so uh, I would like to use a database instead and uh, for not littering my controller with the database co code, one thing that I do, uh, do very, uh, very often, uh, um, is to use the, a repository pattern. Mm. So the repository that I have here, uh, the repository pattern has the sole purpose of moving the database code out of the way. Yeah, so that it's very easy um, to, uh, to exchange your database to a different one uh, without the rest of your program noticing. Um, so, here I'm using um, a Mongo database because that's uh, I, I find for for prototyping stuff uh, MongoDB is great. Yeah, because you don't have to you don't have to define anything. Uh, you can start right away. You can bring up a Docker container and then start working. So what we do is that we create a database connection and then we use that database connection here in this repository object or this in this repository class in two modes mode number one is that we find a song by its id and number two is we find a song by its name i think we might use here some uh some here, here this and this is where you could add fancy stuff like i don't know regex search or reg or uh, or fuzzy string matching if your database supports this. I stick to the exact matching here, even if that means that I have to um, adjust some of the tests. And in my controller, I could I could basically um, let's uh, let's make a copy of this code. We have both here at the same time. See if I can comment this out. And I want to replace this by using my repository. No, not monorepo. This should be a song repository, which of course I need to import. Song finder repository import song repositories. So now I want to distinguish two cases. Um, if my query uh, dot name is consists only of numbers. Mm 
then I would like to call the um, find song by ID method. And I think that took an integer. There is that thing. In other cases, I call my result with the repository find song by name. And then let's call this song. song. This is a song, and this is a song. So this is a, mainly to, to demonstrate that you can do quite heavy re-engineering of your, of your code once you have it shielded by, um, um, uh, by a boundary. Uh, so, uh, our test, if everything is set up correctly, this will still work. Uh, before I'm going to test this part, uh, then I'm, uh, I'd like to take the, the questions that popped up in the, um, uh, in the chat box. So PyTest recommends using yield and fixtures instead of return. Um, and then you get a generator of, of song requests. Yes, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's right. That's something that you could do to uh, return multiple things from the fixture. Um, we kept using return most of the time to keep the IDE and the type checker happy. That's a good. That's a good reason. We also have. Uh, uh, we also are using um, return uh, all the time in fixtures. Um, we don't have as as good a reason as you just just wrote there, uh, but. The uh, the main reason is is that uh, my fixtures they are usually rather small like like reading from a JSON file, and um, there's not really a reason uh, to return multiple things. When is the best time to use return and yield? Um, yield is when you have some tear teardown. Yes, uh, the 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 main difference between yield and or one main difference between yield and return is um, if I go, where's my contest? Um, with yield, um, re with return, the, the function ends immediately. Um, if you, for some reason, at the end of the, when you don't need the fixture anymore, um, if you would want to, um, to destroy it, then, um, um, uh, then you could do that here. Uh, if you're interacting with a database, uh, that might be a good, re uh, good, good reason to do so. It's also like if you have a database based fixture, for instance, write something into the database for testing, run the test and then take it out again. That, that would be, uh, be a great place to, uh, to use yield. Um, second question, do you run MyPy uh, and other code sanity tools like linters on tests? Um, yes, I do. I don't use MyPy. Um, I usually trust the, um, uh, the, the hints from PyCharm. PyCharm is very good at, uh, at highlighting um, um, the, the type, all kinds of type violations. Um, they are not uh, they are not visible right here because I did not create this here as a regular um, uh, project in my PyCharm. Uh, but you can activate uh, uh, type hints, um, and that's that's all we need because they are so uh, so easy to see. Um, one uh, linter that we use uh, nowadays a lot is black because black fixes all the style issues. Um, let me uh, let me go to the um, um, let me go to the any, to any file. Let's see if black has anything to say about it. If I something like this, then it does style fixing of all the files and uh, that gets most um, Code PEP 8 guideline issues out of the way. Um, 
MyPy is helpful um, for CICD pipelines. Yes, uh, yes, I agree. But I'm I'm not using it. I did not come to the point where I uh, where I got to uh, to implement uh, MyPy in a CICD pipeline. But it's definitely one. It, it, it's definitely a good idea. I agree. Good. Um, we had this uh, this repository here, and we just edited the the controller in such a way that it starts using the uh, repository. Let's see if my tests are still passing. Yeah, no, they don't. Um, so I think, ah, yeah, okay, I get an error. Why, why do I get an error? Um, my, um, my repository is connecting to a database. I actually do have a Mongo database running, um, but uh, there's nothing inside. Yeah. So, um, so actually, what I would like to do is um, to uh, have a test database running, and then use my tests um, for. Um, um, uh, for filling data into that test database and uh, um, and then um, uh, take the data out again. And that's maybe the last big thing that I want to, to do here and open the floor for like all kinds of general questions. There's two ways how I could do this. Yeah, One of them is I get the database out of the way uh, entirely. Yeah? And that's called uh, mocking. And that is what I what I use like most of the time. And I would like to uh, demonstrate how it looks like. I have an example test here. I put that into the tests for my song finder like this. I move the imports into the into the top section starts getting this import section as this starts getting bigger one might consider running i sort over it to to sort the imports but i'm not bothering with it right now um i would like to what what i do here is i'm importing two things the, the mongo mock library uh that provides a mongodb client that behaves like a mongodb client but is not one and unit test.mock that has the patch function. And this patch function, what it does is it temporarily overwrites, replaces some object in your Python runtime with something else. In this case, um, it hijacks the get client function um, and says, oh, I use my, my own mocked function instead, and that should always return my uh my artificial my fake mongo database yeah so that i can insert some of my own test songs there and i would like to put the so the songs as again it's a fixture uh i'm i don't have that as a fixture currently um so uh let's uh let's let's use the let's write the fixture and the last time i saw that code for loading the song database uh, that was in the um, in the controller. I go to the conf test file and let's make a pytest fixture. Call it songs. So here I wouldn't I wouldn't bother about uh, using um, um, using the yield statement. It doesn't give us anything. Yeah. So I want to load all the files from the from the path, the same path, and I 
because this is now test data, I'm considering that I probably should use uh, either move this file to the tests altogether or create a copy. And in this case, because I don't know whether this is used anywhere else, I'm, I'm creating a copy. And I've had the experience that storing test data in your in your test folder is a a it's a good idea, and b these accumulate over time and they they very much contribute to the power and um, um, and uh, uh, richness of your uh, of your test seed. So test data is something that very much deserves to be be refactored and cleaned and organized from from time to time it does good things to a, to a project so so we have this uh, this fixture here our mock db test should see it and uh what it does it inserts these songs into the the mock database hijacks the uh, the get client function so that it uses the mock database and then we try to find a song request and make a simple assert because I don't want to. Um, I could actually use the song response fixture as well. Song response. And we have all fixtures here in one place. So I can say response. At this point, I'm, I'm starting to get concerned a bit that my, that my tests, they are always testing against the same song. This, this might be a little bit risky that it's testing nothing else. So uh, some some test parameterization at this point uh, might make sense to test a couple of different songs, including those with uh, German umlauts and um, uh, and characters in other foreign languages that are not part of the English alphabet because these sometimes turn out problematic. Let's let's see if this test of DB. Uh, test is running and I want to ignore the other tests for now. So I'm I'm running I test with the test uh, song finder, but I want to only test the mock B test. Let's see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mocker fixture is not defined. Didn't I put in an import? No, I did not. From I test mock import mocker fix shares. I think it's the one. Now OS is trying to sneak into other parts of my code. Let it be so. And JSON, of course. In JSON in alphabetical order. Awesome, I get an assertion error. I got a different song from the database than, than I had uh, than I had requested. Um, what is the, now I need to check what is my song request. Song request with name three, song response with name three. And, um, I insert all the songs. I find a song. Um, the there's a little bit, a lot of input from um, um, a, a lot of output here from from the test and. Uh, I think it's getting the wrong song from the database. Let's see what the repository is doing. 
this is where I actually would like to print the ID and store it into the song. Is that even used? Yes, I see a one. Why is this a one? So I'm, my, my test is apparently requesting um, something with an ID one from the database and it gets it's getting the correct song, the, the, the German one uh, from the database and this is not matching our expectations. So why is uh, the test requesting song number one? Let's look at the song request fixture. It's not, it's not requesting. Ah, there is, there, there is in fact a one. So let's make it a three. That's why everything, everything was, uh, was fine. Only the, uh, only the fixture was wrong. Good. So we have successfully mocked the database away. So even if I switch off my database or I would use it for something else, then. Um, uh, it would still work, but I think my other tests um, would be failing at this moment because um, um, I get complaints about empty queries because my database is empty. Yeah, so we can. Um, this means that for the for the other tests, we would have to um, use a somehow fill the song database with test data and I'll do this I I do another fixture for that and that's the last fixture or generally the last thing that I want to want to write today so my last fixture fixture is going to be and this is where we can actually use the uh, the yield that um, that you recommended. Um, so make a song DB fixture. I think in PyTest it should be possible um, to use a fixture in a fixture. I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure about this one. But what I want to do is I want to take the repository. No, sorry. Wait, no, I want to um, have a client that I import from the song finder repository. Um, get client. And then say client song db songs insert many songs. this is my this is my collection in uh, in mongodb let's put that into a variable and check in the repository whether i use the name correctly song db dot songs it's song db here it's songs there we are we are writing all those fixtures to keep our test code as simple as possible because when you write tests you your tests could be wrong or your code could be wrong um, if your tests are simple then the likelihood that your code is the one who's that you can focus on fixing is much higher. Um, so I yield, let's yield that collection. And then I can say collection.delete. Oh gosh, what was the name? What, what, what was the function uh, to, to delete from a 
um, imagine delete. Is it like this to release everything? It's getting late. Um, I might have to look this up. Uh, but this is how how you would use a fix a fixture that uh, cleans up after itself. One of you, one of you uh, said that you could choose an auto use fixture. Yeah, that's that's right. But then it need, doesn't need to be imported in every test. But what what do I do? If I have one test, can I can I disable that auto use fixture for one for one test? If I want to use mocking, like usually, usually I would want to use the real database in half of my tests. I'd call them integration tests and the the mock database in the other half. Usually, usually you you don't need uh, you usually you need both because this Mongo mock has its limitations. It only works for um, for some features. I, I'm not sure if this delete many is uh, is correctly spelled. I don't want to spend time googling at um, uh, at one thirty uh, at seven thirty in the evening. So um, um, so let's see if we get the other part working yeah no so i don't i don't think this worked is this a is this a, uh, is this a I, now i see that two two tests have passed um so does is this code uh, is this code being reached at all Yes, I think it is. This is good. Mm. Then which one is failing? Test been some error. And and song. Uh, this gets the song, but it doesn't convert it successfully because it's a nun. I'd like to see that very important. Interestingly, the 999 fails are ah, because it's still trying to um convert so i need to check if the song exists return the song that may gives me a working um uh a working thing and then this last one this is probably this is probably some some small some smaller spelling um uh, some smaller special spelling issue that i do not want to uh to fill uh in uh a chase right now uh, i think um we've got the main idea from where you can go with uh different test concepts we've seen in opposite reverse order of appearance we have seen mocking of uh stuff that uh that Tend in the uh, tend to get in the way like database connections. We've seen lots of uh, lots of different fixtures. We've seen um, tests against boundaries, tests against errors, tests against endpoints, and these all can be nicely composed. None of these tests are uh, very long at this point, um, but they all help to make your uh, code reliable and uh, keep your API up and running. Um, I check the, the chat box whether there's any other comments and I'd like to open the floor for further questions. Uh, so there's a comment about uh, fixtures that, um, that use this auto use feature uh, 
uh, that are automatically imported. This is something that I need to try because uh, this case where you want to prepare something like a like a database and then clean it up later. This is something that is in fact very, very, very common. Okay. Um, other, um, so you could, what I read from your comments is that um, you could uh, place the, uh, the fixture in the same file as your tests and that auto fixture would then only be used for the tests in, uh, in that file. Um, great, uh, exactly. Um, so, so that would be in fact a very, very convenient way to uh, get rid of these, uh, these extra imports. I could put this, let's try that. We can put the SongDB fixture. I put it here at the beginning of my file. The fixture is importing another fixture. This one is the songs is auto imported. And now I say, um, Auto means true. And now I should be able to delete all the occurrences of song DB here. And aha, my mock test. Then I would use my mock test into a separate file so that the auto use feature. Um, uh, uh, does not get in the way. I put this for now with the uh, with the entity tests. See if I still get that one failing tests test. No, I have to fix my imports. Um, which one was it? Like all this mock and mocking. Stuff goes here. Get client is not defined. Ah, the get client was uh, was in the um, in the fixture. This is something where the uh, where the pie charm. Uh, features for um, um, for refactoring come in really handy, but I cannot use them and talk at the same time. Great. Now we are back to um, two fa one one failing test to uh, to passing tests, and if I run the entire test suite, everything else. I think my endpoint test would, would still fail at the moment because they also would need that test uh, database fixture. Yeah, um, but we we get the idea. Good. That is basically. Um, th thanks very much for uh, for this auto use feature. This is ins very insightful um, and helps to to structure uh, tests with a lot of code. We have a question or a comment. For example, we want to test several scenarios when each flow that requires multiple requests to the API and the order of the flows is important. How can we combine multiple steps into suites and make these suites run in a defined order? Um, I, I hope I, um, I, I understand um, uh, I hope I understand the question correctly. Um, like, suppose um, uh, suppose you want to to run multiple um, uh, multiple requests that somehow belong together in a certain I can, sense. Uh, yes, please. Yeah, I can. Hi. So, so, for example, hi. Uh, so, for example, we want to um, uh, run a series of API requests to the uh, our. API that we test in, like for example, register a user, do this, do this, do that, and then assert this. And this would be a uh, one flow. And then next flow would would um, suggest that the data about the user is already sitting in the database, and we want to run another series of tests. So 
like how could we do this okay um uh so if uh, the um um so one thing uh to, to or two two hints like um there there's nothing um uh th there's nothing wrong with splitting up a test or ca calling multiple subfunctions from a test yeah so uh uh you could you could have your test uh step one step two step three um and uh, have each each step in one of those and uh, use the test to orchestrate these now if some part of this is becoming more complicated like le let's say just supposedly uh, if creating the user is a step that uh, that takes five seconds every time for for whatever reasons and you want to do this only once um then you might want to define that uh, as a uh, as a setup step so um um so uh, you can group tests into a class um uh make your test cases individual methods and then you could hear a uh, something like a setup um that is then called i think setup class would be the word uh, that um that pytest uses to um uh once for uh test run um uh this is where you would do your user setup and uh the the other steps that they would come after uh, after that in the chat box um someone is um uh, referencing the pytest steps module i'm not familiar with that one um but i could i, I could imagine that it, that is also some um uh, some useful solution yeah so i i would look into how uh how classes help you to organize the setup and tear down process so because uh, your test classes in pytest they have several uh setup they can have several setup methods like once once at the beginning of the entire test suite and once uh when this class starts and then one at the end and, and then one uh right before every test um if the if this yield feature in the fixtures is, uh, is not doing uh giving you enough uh structure Or one one uh, thing that I very frequently have is um, uh, that I I sort my tests into uh, things that are fast and things that are slow, because the uh, the fast ones are the ones that I want to execute like very very many times as I'm uh, as I'm programming, especially in debugging. Even even some something like tests that run for uh, ten seconds, this already feels very long. Are there are there other questions from uh, from the audience? If we need, there's yeah, there's a question. If we need, can we run two tests simultaneously? I think PyTest has a uh, some asynchronous features, but this is where, where where I usually take my hands off and say, "Oh wait, I need to uh, I, I need to read deeper into this uh, because there's really easy it's really easy to produce unwanted side effects." Uh, but as a as a matter of uh, as a means of speed up, I think it's possible. Yes, take a look at PyTest Xdist. I'll. I'll take note of that one. Good. I think I'm um, reaching the end of this uh, this tutorial. And I, what I'm going to do um, after uh, I had a uh, after I had a 
um, break or uh, or a night's sleep is that I'm going to take the results of um, uh, of this session because they are they are a little bit different from the solution that is already on GitHub um, and uh, make this this last failing test pass and then upload it in a separate folder in case you would like to uh, look it up. So um, the material is all available under an open source license uh, in case you would like to run a similar tutorial for your own audience or copy stuff for your own purposes. Copy, reuse everything you want. Um, um, I'm happy to help. And uh, I'd like to give back to Data Science UA. It's been very grateful that you've uh, had me over here. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, I hope that by this time next year, uh, the future looks brighter as it looks right now.